said, Sparky, you know, these stories have been going around for years, and everybody says that nobody saw it directly. I'm going to ask you, are they true? He said, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're true, Dick. Have you ever wondered how you would react in combat? Ever wondered whether you'd be cool under fire or be the one hiding in the corner calling out for mama? Well, if you're anything like me, you've pondered this very question many times before in your life. And like me, you may have developed an obsession with those brave few who have actually faced such adversity and thrived. Today, in the very first ever episode of Absolute Legends, we're going to explore such an individual. He's a man seemingly unfazed by the human condition. A man who did not wilt in the face of death. Unapologetic in life, uncompromising in deed, seemingly invincible in the thick of combat and unshakable in resolve. Today we're going to talk about the dog himself, Lieutenant Colonel Ronald C. Spears. I didn't think to put my daughter in uh... I don't care what other people say. Really was coming from my face, here and there. Never in the field of human conscious was so much owed by so many to so few. By the content of that character. Where did we get such men? At the going down of the sun, we will remember them. Charles Spears was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1920, where he lived the first four years of his life until his family relocated to the United States. Young Spears arrived in Boston, Massachusetts on December 25, 1924, a perfect Christmas present for a nation that unknowingly faced the Second World War. Spears settled in quickly and in keeping with his eventual legacy, signed up for military training while still in high school. He fit in so well there that he ended up getting commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Infantry. When the United States entered World War II in December 1941, Spears immediately volunteered for the relatively new paratroopers division. It was the very first time that paratroopers would be used on a large scale in combat. While there, he served as platoon leader in Dog Company, 2nd Battalion of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which would later go on to become the illustrious 101st Airborne Division. Spears shipped out of Camp Decoa, Georgia, in late 1943, bound for England. After his arrival in England, he began training and preparation for the invasion of France. On the 6th of June, 1944, Lieutenant Ronald Spears parachuted into Normandy during Operation Overlord, the Airborne's contribution to D-Day. Despite the chaos that ensued, Spears leaped into action the moment his feet touched the ground. The young lieutenant managed to gather together a small group of soldiers into a platoon, before leading them into combat during the assault on Braycourt Manor, where he single-handedly captured the fourth 105mm howitzer. Rolling artillery strikes were planned for the following morning to support the ground assault, and it was around then that the first major point of law regarding Spears would occur. According to Private First Class Art de Marzio, a replacement sergeant disobeyed a direct order to hold position during the assault on saint com de mont Apparently this sergeant was drunk and belligerent, and wanted his men to charge the German position without any regard for the incoming artillery strikes. Spears, who was now in command of 2nd Platoon Dog Company, was ordered to halt the attack on saint com de mont so the headquarters could coordinate the rolling artillery strike that included 15 targets in the vicinity. De Marzio, who was lying prone next to the drunk sergeant, heard the order to hold being passed down through the line, but again the sergeant refused to obey the order, and still intended to charge ahead and engage the Germans, which would have cost the lives of many soldiers. Once again, Spears relayed the order to hold this time to the sergeant's face. He ordered the sergeant back to the rear because he was too drunk to perform his duties. The sergeant wasn't happy with this and reached for his rifle to draw down on Spears. But Spears drew his sidearm faster, firing one round which struck the sergeant in the head, killing him instantly. This event was witnessed by the entire platoon who later confirmed that it was an act of self-defense. Spears immediately reported the incident to his commanding officer, Captain Gerres Gross. Gross came out to investigate the scene and talked to all witnesses involved. 
upon consideration of the evidence, he determined that the incident was indeed justifiable self-defense. Gross would be killed in action the following day, and the incident was never pursued. Another point of law reported by Private Malarkey occurred just before the Braycourt Manor assault. Six German soldiers had been taken prisoner and were assigned to dig a hole just outside the American camp. Apparently Spears walked up, offered each of them a cigarette and then gunned them all down. At first it was believed to be only a rumour, but Spears later confirmed it to be true when Winters approached him about including it in his book. Although the act was reprehensible and would definitely result in court martial in today's army, it is worth remembering that the Allied soldiers were ordered not to take prisoners because they had no facilities to detain them, nor could they release captured German soldiers back into circulation when they had strategic information on Allied troop movements. Captain Winters believed that command turned a blind eye to these accusations because of the shortage of battle commanders who were not afraid to engage the enemy. During the Normandy campaign, Spears was hit by a German M24 grenade and received injuries to his face and knee. He recovered quickly and returned to Dog Company to resume his duties. On the 17th of September 1944, during Operation Market Garden, Spears voluntarily swam across the River Nether to reconnoitre enemy activity. He was alone in enemy territory. Spears still managed to locate a machine gun nest, enemy headquarters and troop movements near the town of Wageningen. While swimming back across the River Nether to relay the information to his superiors, a German machine gun opened fire, striking him in the leg and the buttocks. He was fired upon for the entire duration of his swim back, but despite his wounds, still made it back across the river to his own lines. Spears was awarded the Silver Star for his actions on this day. On January 13, 1945, Easy Company under the command of Executive Officer Captain Richard Winters launched an assault on the German-occupied town of Foy in Belgium. The plan was to charge across 200 meters of snow-covered ground to reach the village, then clear the Germans out of the buildings by using hand grenades. The plan was going well at first. Easy Company moved swiftly in a skirmish line towards the village while laying down a wall of covering fire. First platoon flanked left, reached the protection of some farm buildings, and the second and third platoons continued to move forward. The commander of the assault, First Lieutenant Norman Dyke, made the serious tactical error of taking cover behind some haystacks, and then to compound his error, he called second and third platoons over to join him. Now that they were consolidated and stationary, the men came under heavy German fire, which resulted in many casualties. Lieutenant Dyke ordered 1st platoon to circle around the town to flank the enemy, but once exposed from cover, the 18 men of 1st platoon were pinned down by snipers and suffered casualties. Dyke panicked, froze in place, and he didn't know what to do. Captain Winters, who observed the assault, tried to raise Dyke on the radio, but to no avail. He looked around for someone to send in to assist, and the first person he saw was Lieutenant Spears. Spears charged straight over the 200 meter field, where he threw a hail of gunfire and exploding shells before reaching the haystacks. Once there, he relieved Dyke and assumed command of Easy Company. The first issue at hand was ordering 1st Platoon to cease the flanking maneuver, as they were getting chewed up by sniper fire. But there was a problem. The radio had been destroyed in the firefight at the beginning of the assault, so Spears decided that he had to deliver the orders personally. Without the slightest hesitation, Spears ran straight through the center of town, right through the lines of German soldiers and tanks. The Germans watched on as Spears sprinted past him, frozen by a mixture of awe and surprise at the complete audacity. Spears linked up with the first platoon and relayed his orders to them, and once they were fully briefed, he turned around and ran straight back through town, again. Not one German soldier fired on Spears while he was in transit, they just couldn't believe what they were witnessing. Quite encouraged by this new leadership, Easy Company doubled down. They concentrated their fire and managed to make headway. As Spears barked out orders and cut his way through enemy soldiers, the men of Easy Company realized they had found their champion, and bolstered by this new confidence and leadership, they fought hard and eventually won the day. Captain Winters was so impressed by Spears' courage and leadership that he reassigned them as commanding officer of Easy Company, a position that he would retain for the remainder of the war. Although Spears had just turned defeat into victory, the elation did not last for long. Easy Company was immediately sent back into combat. 
The village of Nolville had been a hotly contested area since the beginning of the Battle of the Bulge. Nolville just lay northeast of both Foy and Bastogne. The US Army was trying to stop the flow of German tanks and trap them there in a bottleneck. Colonel Sink ordered the 2nd Battalion to lead the attack. Easy Company was a part of the 2nd Battalion, and Spears, in command of Easy Company, would have to once again cross open ground and clear a wooded area in order to reach Nolville. Unfortunately for Easy Company, the Germans still held the high ground that surrounded the town. It was a death trap, but Spears had earned a high reputation amongst the men, and they trusted him to get them through. On approach to Nolville, Easy Company encountered heavy resistance, so Spears set up teams to lay down cover fire that suppressed the Germans and allowed small groups of men to sneak across the stream, where they dug foxholes in the woodland and billeted down until morning. Despite the odds, Spears succeeded in getting all of his men into position and then sat down with his officers to outline a plan of attack. The assault on Nolville started at dawn. Even though the Germans held the high ground and were dug in and had heavy tank support, Easy Company, led by Spears, cut their way through the lines and inflicted severe damage on the enemy. As a result, the 2nd Battalion held Nolville by noon that day. However, even though another tactical feat had just been accomplished, there was no time for celebration, as the next day General Taylor ordered Easy Company back into combat. The village of Rechamps lay to the east of Nolville. However, having lost ground to the Americans, the Germans were now on the run, and when the 2nd Battalion showed up at Rechamps, they fled town. After successfully sacking Rechamps, Spears set up the company command post in the convent there, and the nuns were so happy to see them that they arranged for a choir to sing for the battle-weary American soldiers. The following day, after a long winter of intense combat, the 101st was finally ordered off of the front lines. The war ended before Easy Company could be transferred to the Pacific Theater. During the course of World War II, Spears received wounds to his face, legs, hand and back. He refused to be evacuated each time and chose instead to continue leading his platoon. For this doggedness, he was awarded the Bronze Star. Spears' awards and citations include the Silver Star, the Legion of Mirror, the Bronze Star Trio Clusters, the Purple Heart Four Oak Clusters, and the Army Commendation Medal. Even though Spears had enough points to go home after World War II ended in May 1945, he elected to remain in the Army. He went on to fight in several other theatres, bringing with him the same stoic heroism and combat effectiveness that worked so well against the Germans. On the 23rd of March 1951, he took part in Operation Tomahawk during the Korean War. He commanded a rifle company and was tasked with securing the drop zone. Over 50 enemies were killed by his unit on that particular mission. After the Korean War, Spears signed up for Russian language training in 1956 and served as a liaison officer to the Red Army in East Germany during the Cold War. Later he became governor of Spandau Prison in Berlin where several high-profile Nazi officers, such as Rudolf Hess, were being held. His final assignment in the army was as a plans officer in the Pentagon. He retired as a lieutenant colonel in 1964. Not much is known about Ronald Spears' personal life. He was a man who liked to keep to himself. We do know that while stationed in England, he fell in love with a widow by the name of Margaret Griffiths and married her in Wilshire on the 20th of May, 1944. They had one son together, Robert Spears, who in an ironic twist of fate would later become a lieutenant colonel himself. Unfortunately, after the war, Margaret did not want to move back to the United States with Spears, as she was very close to her family and didn't want to leave them behind. Spears would marry again to a woman named Elsie, but I wasn't able to source any real details about their marriage. Lieutenant Ronald C. Spears died in St. Marie, Valley County, Montana, on the 11th of April, 2007. He was 86 years of age. It's unfortunate that Spears was so reluctant to talk about his experiences during the war. Even his family didn't get anything out of him until just before the end. He seldom attended even the reunions with his fellow Easy Company veterans, and I was unable to find any video interview with the man himself. It's hard to even source photographs of him. 
I guess this trait just lends even more mystique to the lieutenant colonel. According to the men under his command, Spears was an incredible soldier. Brave, stern, unshakable. They found courage under his example and total confidence in his leadership. I myself am fascinated by guys like Spears. Everybody likes to think that they're going to be the action star. But I think most of us would be surprised to find that it is very rare. Everybody's scared, but not everybody can perform when they're scared. And I think that's what makes men like Ronald C. Spears so fascinating. They were in it. In hell. And they dealt with it. Anyway, God bless you, Lieutenant Colonel Ronald Spears. We need more men like you. And it was a genuine pleasure to do this video. I wanted to make it as good as I could. Thank you for your service. To everybody who's watched this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for making it this far. Tune in again for the next one. God bless. We all had fear, but we all had training to know that uh, you try to handle your fear and, and work to accomplish what you're supposed to be doing.